So I think we had uh, advanced a little in our attempt to make an archaeology of commandment and especially in trying to understand how the commandment works, which is this peculiar force of the language on which commandment is grounded. I think we try to, to make some step in that direction. And now we are going on, and then tomorrow we will approach the problem of the will, which is also a key word to understand our problem. But today let's go discuss it a little again in the same directions today. And let's, so let's try to fix some points. we have done till now in the same We have tried to uh, really grasp the importance of the pragmatical, illocutionary function of language, let's say to Deleuze, Ducrot, etc. But also try to uh, clearly see its relationship with the semantic, semiological, aphantic uh, function. But once we have understood the link between these two elements, let's say, of the linguistic machine, then probably we can understand in a different perspective also the political function. try to say something on this. <coughs> In Western tradition, we saw uh, through logic, uh, the uh, language has not been considered as having a political effectuality. It's always considered in its uh, cognitive, <coughs> communicative function. But then, starting from the 60s in France and in Italy in the 70s, it became evident through the political growing function, the growing political function of the media, it became evident that language had acquired a political status a political function, and even a fundamental political function in our societies. So, so we have in the 60s the analysis by Guy Debord eh, on the Société du Spectacle, a very interesting uh, um, uh, book in which uh, the function of media is the something as an apparatus that captures the function of language into the political realm. And, well, I suppose you are familiar with this analysis. You know, so. <coughs> and then we have in Italy this group was called Potere Operaio, linked to Tony Negri. There also you have an analysis of the political function of a language in a different perspective. So uh, they see the modern uh, stage of capitalism as a, as a stage in which capitalism puts to work language itself. <coughs> so both analysis, I suppose, I suppose you are familiar, so I will not try to explain uh, what they did. Both analyses are interesting and correct, especially the one by Guy Debord. But in both cases, they, nevertheless, they stick again to the language in its cognitive and communicative function. The pragmatic function of language stays in the shape in some way. 
but they are right in so far as I suppose it's said for you uh, today the media is not an instrument of the power the media is a constitutive part of the power the so called contemporary democracies are states in which the government is made through the media. The, the governing function, not something parallel. Uh, so the media are part of the, of the governance. And then the, there is a problem because uh, the, on, on the contrary, the political conceptions and even the language of the constitutions of the, each country uh, does not take into account this fact. Uh, while on the contrary, the media should appear and figure in the constitution as one of the organs of the power. So the legislative power, parliament, executive power, and then the media should appear, but they don't. That's, uh, this ambiguity is, makes the special danger of the media because they are not recognized. They do not avoid their political function, but they exert it in such a strong way that it's clear that the media are more power, powerful than, for instance, the chief of the government of a of country like in Italy. They coincide, like in Italy, so they coincide. So you have a country like in Italy in which the chief of the executive is also the chief of the media. But nevertheless, it, also in different countries, often the so, the, the, so the, it's not like we, we are accustomed to know that uh, today the international big capitalism is more powerful than the government of a single state. But also the media <coughs> are often more powerful than the single state. So, but uh, again, usually this is not only seen in the the function of communication. So the media organize the communication in such a way that it can be directed in some certain direction. But we should, now after the analysis we have done, <coughs> we should see, try to uh, enlarge this, ana widen this analysis just to see how the media also uh, work through the non apophantic and illocutionary functions. So, commandment, but also advice, uh, persuasion, promise, uh, threaten, uh, prayer, even. So, I think that we should make, uh, we could make an analysis of the political function of the media today, also trying to see how they <coughs> employ also these aspects of the one we have uh, tried to uh, analyze in our seminar. And this is quite lacking, you know, because uh, often uh, it's only one of the functions of the language which is uh, analyzed. And then in this perspective, uh, the least suggestion that uh, language always embodies or, or carries on a uh, a mood order in the past, but it would be interesting to see uh, how this uh, is then taken uh, in the system of power. Is that clear? So, I mean, uh, the, the function of media today as a political function? Yes? Is um, the media also contain a constituting potential? So, we see, so, the sort of Arab revolutions. Was, pre was precisely using media as constituting power, not necessarily. You see, they flipped the levers. So I'm just curious how we might understand this function too. Like new media. Yeah, you're right. As the media has a real political power, not only an instrumental political power, so we could uh, uh, look to this power also in the perspective not only of the constituted power but also of the constituting power. I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, division. Mm -hmm. This comes from the public law. So the, uh, you have a constituting power, 
And then you have a constituted power. So I mean, for instance, you have a, a French Revolution and it's a force acting as a, as a constituting power and that will result in a constituted power, a system of norm, laws, and uh, uh, the law always has these two aspects. Yeah? And uh, in some way, oscillates from uh, the pole of the constituting power and the constituted power. And again, they are part of the same machine and they cannot be separated. So it's really, in some way, what are you suggesting is really extreme that the, the media can function also as a constituting power. But it's true because if they had a, a complete political function, in some cases, they can act as a changing the constituting power, and then we we'll try to orient and uh, direct uh, the constituting force in a certain direction. And, um, it's like that, okay. And also this change, in this, this, uh, this perspective, we have also to change in some way uh, our conception of uh, the difference between theory and praxis. The problem of this difference is uh, often uh, mis uh, not really understood in a correct way. You know that in, uh, for instance, the democratic tradition, the freedom of speech, you know, which is uh, demanded and uh, described as fundamental, is also justified because uh, theory is a discourse which is <coughs> in some way neutral with respect to the praxis. So it must be free. You have the right of saying anything because you are in the, on the plan of discourse, of theory, and, and not on the plan of action. Well, as you know, the, on the plane of action, immediately the law can intervene. So there is a freedom of speech, but not a freedom of the action, of course. But this is really this is a fundamental point. That the freedom of, of speech is grounded on the fact that uh, the theory of speech is neutral. If what we saw, the days of the crow, etc., that on the contrary, language is never neutral, is never only apophantic, it's always, it carries always within, within itself a pragmatic moment, so an element of action. There is no theory, no real theory, which has not an element of action, of praxis in itself. That, that's why this uh, democratic scheme is so uh, unsatisfying, because then we see that very often people are persecuted for what they say. And, but, but the power is right, huh? so it's not that the power is horrible, uh, persecuting people for what they say. No. As theory is not neutral, as language contains always an element of action, power is right in persecuting people. Of course, we are not. Uh, we don't agree with Hegel, but uh, it's perfectly justified. Mm -hmm. And we see you now, if we carefully see, each time that a person, a think, or a politician really engages himself in what he says or writes, it can be the Marquis de Sade or. Uh, my friend Julien Coupa now in France who has been persecuted. And they are always persecuted for what they say. The Marquis said he done nothing. But it was persecuted for the book he had written. And uh, again, my friend Julien Coupa has been persecuted for <coughs> what he had written. But we will be uh, really in genus, you can say, uh, I mean, uh, too simple on our part to blame the power for that. It would be ingenuity, naive, it would be naive on our part to blame the power for that. 
and, and that's why we see that in, in, in every epoch in the Ancien Regime as well as now, the power finds always the way to also uh, persecute, pursue the, what has been written and said, etc. <coughs> so the idea that there is a, a purely theoretical plan of language which is totally neutral with respect to praxis and action is false. <coughs> A real, uh, when we have a real theory, we have always an element of action in it. Even, uh, even if it is uh, the etica more, ge more geometrical demonstrata by Spinoza, it's, it's more geometrical, it has an incredible element of action in it. And this goes with the what we saw, no? in a way, is another consequence of the primacy of the cognitive perspective in our culture. In our culture is dominated by uh, a kind of a prestige or a friend prominence of knowledge, the cognitive uh, uh, moment on the other aspects. And, and this is not uh, this is uh, the origin of many mistakes and misunderstanding you know, this primacy of the, the cognitive element because it's, the, this primacy is also grounded on the fact that it exists a plan where thought language are pure, neutral only cognitive this idea that uh, it exists uh, a plan of pure cognition <coughs> is a mistake. <coughs> and then it's also <coughs> there's another also consequence of this um, primacy of prestige of cognition in our culture that uh, uh, in modern times, <coughs> philosophy tended to be conceived as a theory of knowledge, a theory of cognition, theory of knowledge, starting from Kant in some way. More and more, then you have uh, epistemology. So philosophy uh, retreats in the position of a theory of knowledge. And, but this is a very bad position eh, for, for philosophy, eh? it, 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 especially because a, a, such thing as a pure theory of knowledge could not exist, cannot exist. And then also because um, another uh, negative element in this uh, prestige of cognition in our culture is that um, we try to consider what is not knowledge in a kind of negative way. While, on the contrary, the ability of articulate zone of unknowing is essential to man. We must be able to articulate zone of unknowing, but not in the form of what in psychoanalysis became the unconscious, so repression. And not you see, there you see again, uh, Freud had a perfect, uh, it was incredible in that, he had a, a clear uh, awareness of the importance of, the no, of what is not known, uh, what is unconscious. But in some way, it, is sti it has still a kind of negative conception of, of it because it just but it has been repressed and must be brought to the conscience again. Especially in the more simple way of understanding psychoanalysis. On the contrary, we have to un understand <coughs> the articulation of zone of unknowing, not in this negative sense, but as a, a positive 
activity. Deleuze once uh, speaks of uh, what he called a contemplation without knowledge. Uh, he tried to define thought as a contemplation without thought. Uh, sorry, without knowledge. While we are so accustomed to also link thinking to knowledge, who said that thinking constitutes only knowledge, science? Why? Thinking could be, on the contrary, the ability of articulated, articulate zone of unknowing, but not in the negative sense, something repressed, unconscious, on the contrary, something which we, with which we live with. Eh? And that, uh, uh, on the contrary, is the core of thinking, you know? this, this, this suspension of the element of uh, cognition. Who was the thinker? Deleuze. Deleuze. Deleuze speaks of the thing, a thought as a contemplation without knowledge. But this was familiar, well, for instance, in Greek philosophy, it was clear. In Plato, for instance, it is like that. It is a, uh, contemplation is a form of uh, enthusiasm in a man. Why? In modern times, all focus on cognition. What, what can we do with cognition? Not much. Okay, so this point uh, and, and uh, this capability of uh, articulating zone of unknowing is also fundamental in, in this domain we call aesthetics. Eh? The, the grace of a person, the gracefulness of a person goes with its ability of articulate a zone of unknowing. This is what we call and this person is gracious. Because if a person cannot be gracious if it is uh, always conscious of uh, everything that is done is being done. So this uh, zone of unknowing is a very interesting concept and not only in uh, philosophy as a gesture against the, the idea that philosophy equal cognition. But also in aesthetics, you know, with the capability of articulating a zone of unknowing, which is not, not, not negative. Why is it, that's why you say articulate, producing a zone of unknowing. It's not a passive, uh, like the unconscious, which it seems in some way passive. No, it's active. Active production of zone of unknowing. I advise you very much that you must become able in producing zone of unknowing. Yeah. I was wondering if you're familiar with the text, The Great Cloud of Unknowing, it was a medieval anonymous... A, a mystic text. tradition always played on that. No? Of course, we have in um, our culture the tradition is called mystic, who precisely works on this aspect. No? But, but there, and, and uh, what is, you're right, because what is true when you read uh, carefully this kind of books, you see that it's not passive. It is, an, in some way, an activity. So, for instance, uh, when another great mystic, the Spanish uh, great mystic uh, John of the Cross, I don't know if you're familiar, he was, was also a great poet, he has a theory of uh, what he called the night of the soul. A notch of school. But the, the night of the soul, this night of soul, is something <coughs> that you must be able to produce. It does not uh, happen like that. You must be able to articulate the night, in, the night, you will say, the notch of school, in all the function of your soul. So it will. Uh, Later, many functions of the soul, for instance, memory. So you must be able to articulate the zone of the night in memory. Then will. Then you must be able to articulate the zone of night in of night, night, not sure and will, etc., etc. So we see it's interesting because we see clearly that it is active, but nevertheless, it's always uh, in the last moment grounded on a neg negation. 
So we have this thing which is called negative theology. We cannot see what God is, we can only see what God is not. And, and this is a mystic tradition. We are trying this way, we are in some way describing this great tradition, which is the, the mystic tradition in Western culture, which is important for, for that reason. But in some way, in order like John of the Cross, I think it's particularly interesting because it's clear that it's an activity. The night of the soul is an activity that you produce. By the way, this image of the night is interesting because once I discussed with the neurologist, who worked on vision. And speaking with him, I was speaking about this problem of the night and the mystics. And he was very interested because he said, ah, but you know, uh, we, in our uh, work, work uh, on the eye, we discovered that what we call the darkness is not a privation of light. No way. We are used to imagine that when we close the eyes or when there is no more light, the darkness is a passive result of the privation of light. Of light. Not at all, he said. Darkness is produced by the peripheral cell of the retina. They are called, so they are a, a, a kind of a cell in the retina which are called off cells, which in certain situations, lack of light, produce the darkness. So the darkness is the result of the activity of the cell. So the darkness is a, a producing of the eye. That's very interesting. It corresponds perfectly to the mystic, what we are, what we are saying here. So the, the darkness is a produce, an activity of the retina. In the same way, the zone of unknowing we are speaking must be a, an activity of the Capability, not a passivity. And, and mystic, uh, you have uh, this card, <coughs> you have so often the awareness of the, this, but sometimes also you have an excess of the negative aspects. So it seems that uh, it's just uh, a result of a negation. But uh, you're right. Keats' idea. Yeah. What is? Yeah, that, 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 it's interesting. No, the, the, this uh, uh, in Keats, where this uh, negative capability is also linked, uh, uh, in this beautiful letter to the, his uh, sister, if I'm not mistaken, also with this idea that the poem has the poet has no subjectivity. The poet is a man completely deprived from uh, the subjectivity and he has this beautiful descri description if I enter a room and some people are is there, even if there is a child, I completely am completely reduced to annihilated. I'm completely annihilated and I'm reduced to to nothing. But this, according to him, is precisely the presupposition the right condition for making poetry is uh, disubjectivation in some way. See, in some way, in some way uh, again, uh, Keats describes this as something that happens to him. He enters a room, uh, there are two people or even a child, co immediately is uh, com completely disubjectivated. But, on the contrary, we can read this as a theory, again, of the capability of the poet of uh, articulate a zone of unknown, a zone of night, a zone of unknown, unknown. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a, it's a capability, a negative, but a capability. No, we, have, we have a long, a long tradition in our culture opposed to this uh, prestige of cognition. So our culture is dominated 
by the provenance of knowledge, uh, science, cognition. But again, we have a strong tradition at the same time, which will, on the contrary, counter uh, act acting against this uh, current, I'm trying to go in the other direction. But this direction must be understood as the capability of articulate, <coughs> articulating zone of unknowing. And, and in some way, the example of kids I think is good. This is linked also to the possibility of uh, creating something. <coughs> Don't, uh, do not create only by cognition. You must have a part of unknowing. Adam, question in the comment? We did we arrive to speak today? Ah, uh, yes, because of course we are so trying to criticize the idea that uh, there is such a thing as a pure cognitive moment in uh, language, etc., uh, etc. Et mm -hmm. Then the, the other. Um, we we'll also try to add something to what I told this morning on this way of uh, understanding the anthropogenetic event as an, ev an event involving <laughs> the whole of the living being and not only its intelligence and its uh, brain volume, etc. <coughs> And we already saw that we can, in some way, see the social institution, law, for instance, law and religion, just to keep to these two big uh, massive examples, <laughs> as uh, an attempt, in some way, to capture this uh, event of language, this engagement, mode of engagement in which uh, man engages himself, uh, puts at stake its nature in uh, language, in its language. So the uh, religion and uh, law we saw can be seen as an attempt to capture and fix and establish this thing. So they are an important function because they aim at establishing in a stable way this link between man and language. Because what, what happened it was a, we could describe it as a link between man and language. Then society tried to institutionalize, institutionalize this link and <coughs> fix it in some way, make it stable. And uh, because, uh, in some way, it is as if this uh, uh, becoming, speaking of man, this link between man and language contained some danger that uh, law and religion and society in general try and attempt to stop. Uh, here I'm referring, uh, there is a very interesting uh, French uh, Difficult to define. Is it uh, only linguists or an anthropologists or uh, Georges Dumézil? <coughs> Georges Dumézil is the one who invented this uh, interesting theory, according to which Indo-European societies are grounded on a tree function. Uh, in all Indo-European uh, society, in its archaic uh, form we found these three functions, the priest, the warrior, and the country, the agriculture. Farmer. What do you say? Farmer. Farmer, yes. Yeah, so you could also say religion, war, and uh, productive activity. So according to him, this uh, tribal function, you see this, 
is present in each of the European society, you will find set always a form of priesthood, always a form of a warrior, almost always a form of a form of production. But then he also says that each of these uh, three functions uh, contains a possibility of danger. What he called uh, in French a fléau functionnel. I don't know so how to translate it. A functional plague. How do you say it in French? Fléau, plague, pest, danger, sickness, disease. Each of these functions contains the possibility of a disaster, disease, plague. Literally, fléau would be plague, pest. And he says that um, as far as the priest function is concerned, this uh, danger, this uh, sick disease of uh, the function, this, this dysfunction, you say, this possibility of dysfunction, is what he calls the dissolution of the verbal contracts and the denial and uh, or the denial of the obligations taken by the world. So the priesthood uh, is a function of who has the monopoly on this uh, activity. Of, uh, 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 as I told you, in the origin of priesthood and uh, uh, law are together. So the, this, this function has to do with the, the, the obligation taken by this, the world. The, but then the, the specific danger of this uh, dysfunction, dysfunction is the possibility of lie, of, de of denying a, contract, a verbal contract, a verbal obligation, etc. And in this perspective, oath uh, can be seen in this perspective as a kind of a remedy against this danger. So the, the, the priesthood uh, function uh, who guarantees the verbal contracts it is exposed to the danger of uh, disavowal, say, to disavowal, to deny the word, to not be truthful to the word. The transgression of oral. So in this, in this perspective, one could see, see oath, which we discussed it so much today, Yesterday, as being <coughs> a remedy against this. But is that true? If we analyze this more attentively, the function and structure of the oath that we have already seen, uh, the remedy seems uh, uh, curiously completely inadequate. It doesn't it, it, it even contains the possibility of perjury. And we have a very interesting essay on uh, oath in Greek, Greece by uh, a French classicist whose name is Nicole Gorot. And she shows that in the most archaic form of Greek oracles, of Greek curse, oath, uh, the oath is defined by the possibility of perjury. So the, it, is not the, it, is, it is not a remedy because uh, it contains in itself the possibility of perjury. And we saw, but we remember, we saw that Plato uh, was against the usage of oath because this will show in the trial, because this will show that half of the citizens are lying, uh, this uh, perjury. So as, as a guarantee of a, a current a contract of an oral promise, uh, it's a very simple sanction of the lie to be much more effective. The oath has no force against this. Then, now going back to our problem, then perhaps we can make the hypothesis that the real goal, the real end of the oath, it was not to constitute a remedy for the possibility of lying, 
But on the contrary, the institution that we know under the name of, under the name of a oath concerned a fundamental aspect of the language, that is to say, its capability to refer to things. The performative force by which a word can refer to a thing. So, in, in some way, when uh, people in the origin took a note, what it was uh, meaning, what it was aiming to, it was to guarantee the link between word and things. So, the signifying power of language. It could be that so the original aim of the world was not to uh, uh, be, uh, fight the possibility of a lie or perjury, but on the contrary, to ground the link between world and things. This would be uh, in, our, in the perspective of what we saw of the primacy or the necessary presence of an illocutionary moment in language would be in the same direction. So even so the signifying function itself was made possible by this act of language which is both. So the first aim of both was to found the signifying function itself. the link between word and thing. And in this way, ought is very near to nomination. Right? What we saw, giving the names to thing, right? assigning a word for each thing. Uh, every nomination is a commandment, every nomination is a kind of oath. The name is uh, imposed, given, commanded, and it is also sword. It is also the object of the note. So, and, so this, uh, and this explains, uh, we already spoke about this, why in our tradition the language was always divided into different plans or moments the layer of names and the layer of discourse, as if the name brought the possibility of discourse. But then in the, this layer of name was grounded by this moment of the node. And so when in law, for instance, we, we saw this formula, uh, if a man does a uh, sacer esto, and we translate uh, let him be sacred, sacred, but we could also translate let him be called sacred. Every act of the law is also an act of giving a name. I think it would be a reference to Sacresto, Parikida Sesto, can be translated let him be called sacred. So this plan of uh, giving a name and the plan of uh, commandment and consign. Uh, I'm, when I'm saying this, uh, I'm not suggesting that it is really like that. I am, I am, I am, I'm trying to show how in our Western tradition, language is conceived under that paradigm. Name, discourse, nomination, or etc., etc. I'm not suggesting that uh, this is a, a, re a correct and true analysis of what we do when we speak. I'm just uh, trying to, in, in our archaeological Investigation, trying to understand how this paradigm was constituted. But we found this, uh, uh, 
distinction of the two moments of names and discourse everywhere. Uh, for instance, even in Wittgenstein, uh, you will see uh, things we can only name. We cannot tell them the discourse. Things we can only name it. You cannot tell. So it's something that um, is uh, really always present. But again, it corresponds, this distinction between the plain name and plain name, plain names and plain discourse, corresponds again in some way to this ontology. Right? Because the, pl the plan of names, nomination, would fit in the non apophantic logos. It's a commandment given to the plan. refers to thing, it has to refer to thing. So again, the, what we I'm trying to show how this machine is constituted. Through this complex net of relationship and distinction between two elements, which appear again and again in different <coughs> related forms. for me, because um, uh, I think that in the human science, and also if Foucault is true, I also Foucault works with paradigms, and, and then he will name the episteme, but the episteme function, functions also by with paradigm. Uh, but the paradigm is the Greek term for example. And paradigm means example. But then, do we know what an example is? Can one of you try to define what an example is? <coughs> because it is also another aspect in Western logic which has completely uh, neglected, been neglected. So we, we, have, we have a theory of uh, Position of uh, in deduction, induction, you see, like that? Mm -hmm. But then the example, which is a di different way of reasoning, is almost never taken into account. Why is a really important uh, thing? Let's, let's try to, to make a digression. Because it's, uh, it will be, I think, we have to work with paradigm. We are not uh, scientists, we are not uh, really historians. We try to, through paradigms, to constitute and understand a wider object, a wider plan. So, what is a paradigm? Well, first, first of all, um, a para, a, an example is a, a singular case, which we do not know why, acquires the capability of adding value for many. So one example is a single case, which uh, has value for multiplicity. Um, in uh, his work on logic, Aristotle distinguishes and defines deduction and induction. So, uh, what is uh, deduction is a, a movement which goes from the old to the particular. Induction is a movement which goes from the particular to the general. Then, it just, that's the only moment in which he speaks of a paradigm. <laughs> then he says, uh, then there is this other peculiar thing, which usually is uh, 
uh, classified under the category of uh, analogy. Then you have uh, the paradigm in, in which we have a movement from the singularity back to the singularity. This is nothing else. And he calls this analogy. Because uh, he's right, there is no, uh, in, in, in the usage of an example, you have no movement from a particular <coughs> to a generality, nor from a generality to a particular. The example is always a singularity. It remains a singularity, which acquires special uh, uh, power, but remains a singularity. Now, if, if the example become, uh, becomes a generality, if the example becomes a law, it's no more an example. It's never a rule. So the disorder quality to distinguish, the ability to distinguish uh, uh, an example, a paradigm, from a generality, a rule, a law. That's why, so when we work with paradigm, we are not constituting a law which is valid for all the cases. We have a very different and more interesting uh, movement in which a singularity is able to show itself to uh, define a wider set of singularity, but remain a singularity. There is no law constituted. There is no generality, no rule. And that's why Kant once uh, defines the example, saying uh, the example is uh, uh, something which uh, X for an absent rule. It's, uh, there is an absence, there is no rule. But, but then the, the capability of uh, choosing and uh, using correctly the paradigm is very important in our work. Because uh, 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 it's more rich, so the, the induction and deduction, you are then uh, forced to remain in this uh, alternative uh, oscillating movement between uh, the single, uh, particular and general. Well, there you have another thing, perhaps you could call it to distinguish from the particular singular, singularity, but it has. Uh, in the same time, is more than a singularity because uh, it uh, can uh, be valid for all the, uh, the other singularity of the same time without constituting them in a generality. <coughs> so you see, and, um, and also it's interesting how an example function because in some way. So if you you say, give me an example. I will take a single. I will um, uh, extract a singularity from its context. And how will this singularity be able to have value for more than itself? Because it shows its singularity. It shows its uh, appurtenance to to the set. But you are you are extracting them from the set, and then by this gesture of uh, exempting <coughs> them from it will be able to show the set. And in some way it is the contrary of the exception. Because in the exception something is included through its exclusion. While in the example something is excluded through its inclusion. In an exception, something is uh, included through its exclusion. So you are not, uh, but then in some way the exception grants the rule. While the, the, the example cannot be <coughs> the rule because it is uh, excluded through its inclusion. Being uh, set apart, it shows the set. But and nevertheless, it's very complicated to understand the example. But I think that uh, the capability of choosing the right example, the right paradigm, and then working with <coughs> the paradigm is fundamental in, our, in human science, in our work. And, and, uh, and for
Foucault works by European lines. So when they reproach the Foucault, but he is not really an historian. Because for instance, he, he, uh, he, choose, he, he takes the panopticon. The panopticon is a singularity, is uh, something which is, do you know what a panopticon is? So it is a, an architectural model invented by this guy in uh, Great Britain. And, uh, so what, what does Foucault do with this? He takes this singularity, the panopticon, as a paradigm to understand a wider set of phenomena. So it's not uh, making a, a law or, a, or, or investigating a, generaliz a generality. He investigates a singular phenomenon, but using it as a paradigm for something wider. And that's very important in, in, in our investigation of human science. That makes the interest because a singularity remains a singularity but acquires the capability of uh, making knowable the wider set of phenomena. And, uh, that's very interesting. Is this a uh, logic of the paradigm of the example clear? <coughs> Thomas Kuhn uh, in some way also takes the paradigm as an example. Then what he wants to show is how science itself works by the constitution and the imposition of a paradigm as an example which will then uh, ground uh, um, uh, there is this book uh, Optics by that and this is constituted paradigm and then we will have a set of other works which uh, apparently are uh, following a scientific logic but you no know, they are just following this uh, the logic of the paradigm so it's a uh, similar but it's showing how the paradigm can act into the realm of science so the exemplarity the function of the exemplarity in science uh, parag paradigmatic effect of the work um, uh, what you said yesterday that um, psycho psychoanalysis is a private archaeology, right? That what you said yesterday. So the other way around would be that archaeology is kind of a, a public psychoanalysis. And in this, did they say that? No, no, it's not nice this. thing, but I don't think they said. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's uh, just a re reverse uh, interpretation. And um, in this way, could we say that the paradigm is something like the traumatic event in psychoanalysis? Just a very broad analogy, but <coughs> the naming of the paradigm <coughs> at the same time deconstructs it in a way, no? I mean, if I say that it's a paradigm, and um, I'm aware of it. You're suggesting that the, traumatic, the trauma exert um, an action as a paradigm, a paradigmatic action in, in, uh, in the life. Uh, don't get the point. Okay, um, um, I, I tried to make the analogy that you did between psychoanalysis and archaeology, mm -hmm. and um, the other way around, maybe the paradigm in archaeology is what the trauma is in psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Does this make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, this analogy is yeah. um, um, not perfectly clear. No? You're establishing an analogy between the, the trauma and the paradigm. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah, in, in a sense, you could say, yeah, perhaps you just simply <coughs> this, that Freud also works with paradigms. So we must not uh, think that he's uh, really <coughs> uh, working through uh, scientific logic, no, but he's employing a paradigm. So uh, this would be the case for everything in Freud. Every concept in, in Freud could be more precisely seen as a paradigm, an example which then will constitute a whole set of uh, phenomena. Then even uh, Oedipus could be in this. So, so this would be interesting because then uh, uh, Freud is not aiming to constitute general law, but on the contrary, constitute a paradigm for a set of phenomena. Perhaps this could be an interesting way. So it's not establishing 
new scientific laws, new scientific laws. It's establishing paradigms. Probably, probably. Not. Every interesting work <coughs> in science is more done by paradigm than by. You cannot establish a scientific law in the human sciences. So the so-called scientificity of the human sciences is a false problem. I have to comment on that. I think it's a very intriguing idea that you're opening up. I think we shouldn't conflate the many uses or the many nuances of the word trauma. I mean, trauma became a paradigm of psychoanalytic thought. If trauma is rupture, then for archaeology or in Thomas Kuhn's system, it's more like, because in Thomas Kuhn's system, as in archaeology, you have what Stephen Jay Gould called punctuated equilibrium. You have normal science, normal evolution, and then something happens, there's a fissure, there's a break. That break, either in archaeology or the so-called evolution of science, according to Kuhn, that will be the trauma, which then establishes a new paradigm. paradigm. So I think there's that parallel. There's an event or an incident, prefer to call it, that is the trauma in Freud, which becomes a paradigm, as you said, you know, the child's trauma. And the same thing in psychology <coughs> and in Kuhn's method, with this efficient, this agreement, it's punctuated, and then it establishes a new, more stable plateau of ideas and science or of the fossil record. And that would be the analogy. And I think it's a very intriguing idea. Thank you. But I really believe that um, uh, the awareness that um, people who make uh, an interesting work in human science work by paradigms and not by trying to establish general laws or, uh, or only, or, or on the contrary, only particular phenomena. Of course, if they stick only to particular phenomena, <coughs> it can be interesting, but it's not enough. But if you then pretend to establish a general law, so it can be easy, but it's not uh, really proper to even science to do this. Well, the paradigm is a kind of media <coughs> between, medium between the two. It's, a, it's not simply particular, it's not a generality. It's in this movement from a singularity to a singularity, it throws light to a whole set of phenomena. But without pretending to the generality and without remaining only in the particularity. Is there a difference between paradigm and um, the Hegelian um, and? and the Hegelian concrete universality? Universality. Mm -hmm. You know that that I, I don't understand it that well, but I think there's a kind of a relationship between that Hegelian um, concrete universality, where a particular is is what I think is is, is what um. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't understand that. No, but I understand what you mean. Yeah. Can be right. Hegel conceives the, the concept as the most concrete thing. But perhaps more relevant to what we are seeing would be this very interesting Gatian concept of phenomenon. Gate, in his uh, so called scientific uh, investigation, but also in his theorization, <coughs> has this interest concept of an Ur phenomenon. Or in uh, Ur, in uh, German, comes from Ursprung, origin. So when you say a Ur phenomenon, you could translate as an original phenomenon. It's and he always says this, um, in uh, my investigation, I am looking only for original phenomena and not for general law. There is no general law beyond the Ur phenomenon. The only, uh, so to say, generality we can <coughs> consider is this peculiar form of the Ur phenomenon, the original phenomenon, which contains, acts as a paradigm to understand all the related phenomena. But it is only a phenomenon, it's not a law. He tried to grasp the phenomenic uh, sphere in its original moment as an appearance of a new phenomenon, an original phenomenon, 
And he said, there is no theory beyond this. The Ulf Raman contains all. So it is a singularity, but it has this moment of the originality, which constitutes him, I would say, I don't know if he used the term paradigm, I don't think so, but it's very near what we call a paradigm. So it's a singularity which can, uh, which makes understandable, <coughs> you remember he, he worked on the uh, Urpflanze, the original form of the vegetable, the vegetal, you say the plants. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had this idea, he tried to conceive a Urpflanze, which is a real plant, which has the original characters which explain the plants. It's not a law valid for all plants. It's one Urpflanze, the original plant. And, and all in his investigation are under this concept. Uh, I think that's one of the only interesting uh, in this uh, uh, man I profoundly dislike, which is Gator. <coughs> I hope that no German is present here. Because <laughs> <laughs> for many aspects, he was an horrible guy. But he made some interesting things. <laughs> Yes. It seems like there could be some parallels between what you were describing as the paradigm and the password. The password? Yes, because it seems like you know, the password is the entree into me. Yeah, it feels like there's, there's some parallels in the way that you've been describing these two. It's an interesting, interesting question. We saw that the password is also linked to the commandment, to the interlocutionary aspect. Mm -hmm. So let's say, recently, if we take uh, Deleuze's examples, for instance, the declaration of war, declaration of mobilization, or the act of the pirate making an hijack, uh, which will constitute uh, people as hostage, could be see this as a paradigm? I'm not able to answer. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting uh, jump uh, making, but uh, it's a singular, it's true that it's a singular act, act that has an effect on the plurality. Or it feels like, yeah, it feels like it's an entree. But while uh, while the paradigm makes understandable the set, I don't know if you can say that uh, uh, this kind of uh, action uh, mode makes <coughs> understandable uh, a kind of uh, set of phenomena. But we can think about it. It seems like that would lead us into a conversation about... Pardon? It seems like this would lead us to a conversation about uh, mimicry and this problem of just mimesis rather than, uh, or maybe authenticity and inauthenticity. And it seems. Why? Well, so we could say. It sounds like. Maybe I'm just hearing you poorly, but to talk about certain activities as being paradigmatic, it seems to take away some of uh, what's happening. I don't know. It seems like uh, it seems like we're imposing something or not allowing for the singularity of each particular action to occur. Are you saying yeah. archetyping? Yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. That yeah. Archetyping. Because uh. you can have a paradigm. <coughs> and, and, and I don't see the thing like that because it, the, the paradigm remains a singularity. Uh. But it's true that uh, it, uh, it is shown. Why does it uh, acquire the paradigmatical power? Because, in some way, it shows its uh, 
for for instance, yeah. Could you work on this then? Uh, perhaps when we speak on gesture, we come back to this. I, when I take an example from a set, because I'm asked to give an example, this is why I choose, I take up, I extract, I say extract. <coughs> I extract. Abstract. Extract. Extract a, a singular, singularity from a set. <coughs> why does it acquire the capability of uh, making understand about the whole set? Because it shows it's belonging to the set. So there is a, a, an act. Uh, I have uh, to constitute a singularity as a paradigm. This means that this singularity shows its belonging to the set. To the set. It's very. Yes? Well, just to address the, of course, para or para means just side, right? So it's alongside. It's extracted from the set, but it always must be to show alongside it. So it's never totally autonomous. It's a singularity. Never it's totally? Autonomous. It always has a relationship because there's a proximity of side by side. So that's the other aspect of the word that we can also think through. Yeah. It always is beside. And, and per perhaps then we can, uh, for once again, uh, use the etymology. So paradigma comes from para, which means besides. Yeah. And deigma, which comes from the term, the verb deikmi, to show. So a paradigm is something that shows itself besides itself. It's a power of showing something besides para. And then, then the, why I said that uh, to be in order to acquire paradigmatical power, the singularity must show its belonging to the set, so that, that when I give you the example, you understand, because you did not understand the, the set. So I take uh, something out of the set, it shows its belonging to the set, and so now you understand. I now understand what you mean. So it's curious. Uh, but, but again, it's not a general law, it's not a general definition. It's not a definition by, uh, no. The, the, the point is that I'm not defining anything. Because I just took a singularity. So I'm not defining the set. Can you define the set? It's different. So the question can be, can you define the set or can you give me an example? Two completely different procedures. And usually you ask it for an example when Cannot really define. I'm just a little bit confused because if you, like, let's say you have a set of horses, you extract one horse. For example, <coughs> can you generalize from that particular? It, uh, it, it's not the right example for the example. The example for <laughs> the horse is, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know the English term for the color of uh, the, the horse. Did you know how, how the color of horses? Brown. No, there is special. There is a special terminology for the color, the color sauro. So the, because they have, I don't know if ever you have competent. So for instance, they are, they are. You have a horse who has a mantle <coughs> brown, then it has a white, and there is a, always a special name. Ron. So eh? Ron, R -O -A -N. Well, probably I don't know. In, I know the Italian and the French. So the, the right way of uh, showing this promise with really, the I say this term, bro. Roan. Roan horse. So people say, ah, can you give me an example? And uh, if I have a chance, there is a, <laughs> a, a roan horse there, and they show. So it's not an example of the horse, because it's too general. It's, uh, because how can I So I cannot generalize from that particular, even though it came from the set of horses. But, but how, I'm just wondering, how can you be an example when it's a becomes a particular by being extracted from the set. When we can, when we have the fallacy and logic of generalizing from a particular. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the, the problem uh, here is uh, I can ask the definition of a wrong, 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 wrong yes. horse. Then, uh, if I know, if you are an expert, uh, uh, yeah, a uh, wrong uh, horse is the or has a brown mantle and white uh, fields. I don't know, for instance. 
But this is different when the people is not able to give a definition and <coughs> give an example. So then, with your with your question, when you were talking about the password and, and, and the example, I guess the question is: Is this uh, the inco incorporeal transformation of a body when we say this? Rowan horse is uh, yeah, uh, paradigmatic. Yeah, you could say it. Uh, yeah, in this sense, perhaps you could say it. Uh, in order to acquire this power, there is a, there is a transformation. Incorporeal, because of course, not a so it's, physical. It's in the enunciation, it's in nominating this as paradigmatic. Mm -hmm. that, that, that this, in this way, it's. And similar. showing it, because the, the paradigm, as the etymology says, it has the power to show something, not to say, to show. 